Oh, really? So, that's why they're not going to show Except she thought they'd be wrong. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right, tonight we're going to be wrapping up our uh, study on uh, uh, mission and motion. And, um, you know, I, last week I brought you up to, I mean, you remember where we were at. We were talking about your purpose in session one. We were talking about uh, uh, in session two, God's mission as you know, so he sent Abraham out to begin, uh, actually begin the redemption road through Abraham. I mean, Definitely, redemption came through Jesus Christ, but that was the beginning of the beginning of the redemption road. And then session three, uh, the world was reaching the world, and and I, in the one the one scripture in there that I just really uh, Paul talked about out of uh, ten fifteen was how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, and so that one's just stuck with me. And so tonight we're going to be moving into uh, ending up with. Getting involved, talking about getting involved. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 12, 20 through 25. And one verse is going to stick out here for me in verse 25 is, uh, this makes for harmony among the members so that all members uh, care for each other. And that's going to be, a, up to me, is the theme voice. I mean, that's what we're all here about is taking care of one another. Uh, a church is a family. It's a it's a brotherhood and a sisterhood. Um, we can do so much more than we do, uh, and and we we will as we get as we grow. And you know, in this mission, what well, we've been talking about a mission because I you know uh, again, it's it's not about numbers. It's about uh, people one on one. Mm -hmm. It's what it's going to be about, and it's about each one of us with our micro mission that we continue to talk about. Is, is that person. So uh, so getting involved is, is how we're going to wrap this up, <laughs> and we'll have an interesting film here in a minute. But we all have a specific uh, practical part to play in sharing the gospel with people. We uh, To know that the impact we can all have as world Christians, and we're going to talk about world Christians through the film. You'll, you'll figure that, get that, uh, the meaning for that. Uh, to feel excited to have a role in God's mission to all people. And then I underline this one because uh, this to me is for home or abroad. To accept the responsibility of the world Christian dedicated to meeting the needs of unreached home and or abroad. And, you know, I, and we'll probably talk about some of that, but I get, you know, there's so many... Uh, uh, missions out there now that are able to translate Bibles now into so many different languages. And with the internet the way it is, of course, you know, probably some of the jungles that we have that they don't get reached, they probably don't have internet, but there's people that's been willing to go there. And, uh, and but they're now starting to uh, have uh, Bibles into their own languages and whatnot. So we're seeing quite a bit of, of, of movement across the world and I know that we all just can't get up and go, but, you know, our money can go and help those missions go. And that's kind of what we're getting fired back up here about in, in our church. So, uh, have you ever been faced with a problem that seemed overwhelming or daunting? How did you respond to the situation? And did you try to fix it, dismiss it, or allow it to work itself out? Well, I think we all have. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we ever do that. We just keep praying. <laughs> no, I think, uh, I mean, in this world we will have trouble. Yeah. And uh, without Jesus, I don't know how you can get through this yeah, world. That's for sure. And, uh, and I find it even more every day, just, just simple things we do in life, just calling on the Holy Spirit to help us have the intelligence to fix this or do that say the right word and that's kind of where I may take us in this next when we get done with this I may be taking us into a study on the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. uh, mainly just to me it's a real equipping thing mm -hmm. Francis Chan wrote a great book about the Holy Spirit and I read it and and he's got there's a series I want to look at it a little bit and that might be where we go from here because I think if we have that power if we realize we got that power inside of us it will make it easier to talk to that neighbor, make it easier to 
reach out to other people. So that's kind of what say his name was? Francis Chan. Francis. Francis Chan. He wrote Crazy Love. It's a great book. And then he wrote this one about the Holy Spirit that followed that up with. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I mean, he's, he's kind of a, he's pretty good. He's just really good. And I'm, I'm going to look a little deeper in it and make sure it's where we want to go at. So, so as we look into, uh, um, when we're talking about this scripture tonight, this uh, First Corinthians, uh, let's say, uh, 12, 20 through 25, uh, the body needs different function. Uh, I mean, then these are some things where we was talking about. The body needs different functions if it is to live, grow, and serve. No member should compare or con con uh, contrast itself with any other member because each one is different and each one is important. All of us are important as a body of believers. Uh, the members are uh, the members should promote unity as they discover their dependence on one another. And then the diversity in the body is an evidence of wisdom of God. When we have that kind of uh, diversity going on in our body uh, of believers, we know that we're seeing the wisdom of God being shared in our, in our membership. Each member needs the other member, and no member can afford to become independent. So... That's kind of what, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit on what that scripture really going to talk to us about. So let's uh, prepare for this uh, uh, this uh, film we're going to watch. And some of the things he wants us to kind of look for is what is a world Christian and what are the four things they do? What is the difference between a sender and a goer? And what are some of the practical ways that you can serve the mission field? So with that... We need a film. the greatness of our life until we see the greatness of God's story that he's invited us into. You know, my son loves to sing, and so when his middle school did a musical, Beauty and the Beast, he wanted to try out for a part, and so on Friday he came home and he got the part of Maurice, the dad, and so we were so excited for him, we were looking through the script, and my wife realized that, you know, Maurice, the character he got was the only character in the play who had no song to sing, and so we said, man, we've got to tell him. We sat him down said, buddy, I'm so proud of you. You know, you got this part, Maurice, it's going to be awesome. But your character has no song to sing. And he said, yeah, I know. And, and then I asked, well, why, you know, why did you pick that character? He said, dad, by the time I got to the sign-up sheet, the list, all the important characters had tons of names next to him. You know, all the big characters had a list of names next to him. Maurice was the only character who nobody wanted to be, had no names next to it on the list. And then he said this, he said, dad, I just wanted to make sure that I was in the story. You know, what I learned from that is that even a small part in a great story is a great honor. Let me ask you this. What if God was writing a story right now and wrote a part in his story just for you, but you missed it? You left it blank. It, it seems like that's what Jesus is saying in, in Luke 10 too. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's laborers that are missing from God's story, and it's a tragedy. And he says the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is not getting smaller. We've looked at what's left to be done in reaching the world. 7,000 unreached people groups, 3 billion people who have still never heard of Jesus. The world's not getting smaller. And so many of us have missed our part in God's story, not because we just missed it, but because we dismissed it, because it seemed impossible. And so what I want to do is for the next few minutes, I want to look at a story in the New Testament where the disciples have to face an impossible problem. We know this is one of the most popular miracles of Jesus. It's known as the feeding of the 5,000 in the New Testament. And Jesus is inviting the disciples into this moment, and if they'll say yes, they will get to experience being a part of one of the greatest miracles Jesus does. This story is in all four Gospels, and we get different details from each one. But in Mark chapter 6, it starts like this. The hour is late, and the disciples come to Jesus 
and they're looking at this crowd and they say, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. So send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages that they can buy themselves something to eat. They just say, Jesus, send this problem away. Send this crowd away. And you know what? I get it. Sometimes there's problems that we just want it to go away. Well, you know, kind of hope somebody else will take out the trash or change that diaper, right? And that's what our world says. When there's something that's <laughs> uncomfortable, whether it's poverty or injustice uh, or suffering, just look the other way. Change the channel. You know what? When you send away everyone else's problems, you're only ref- left with yours. And, and I think that's one of the reasons our culture is so anxious and depressed because we've sent away all the other problems of the world. You know what Jesus' response was? He said this, but he answered them, no, you give them something to eat. See, Jesus has a cure, I think, for the depression and anxiety we face, and that's for us to live in a world that's bigger than ourselves. You know, when we don't take on the problem of the world, we don't pray, uh, we don't give, we don't share our faith. Uh, Really, we miss out on experiencing God. God calls us to solve big problems, not ignore them. In John chapter 6, when we see this scene, Jesus says he was lifting up his eyes and seeing this large crowd coming toward them. Jesus says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He puts the responsibility on Philip. And he said this, John says, to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. You know, we get some assurance from this verse that Jesus is in full control. He knows exactly what he's going to do, but he says this to invite (laughs) Philip into the story. It reminds me of Psalms 46.10 that says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God has a plan for our problems. God has a plan to reach the world. He knows exactly what he's doing, but he's inviting us to be a part. Philip looks around and says, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to even get a little. And then another one of the disciples, Andrew, Peter's brother, says to him, but there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But he says, but what are they for so many? You know, first they sort of dismiss the problem and want it to go, go away. And then they sort of dismiss even the solution that's right there in front of them as too small. Jesus says, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. We find out from Luke, they sit down in groups of 50. But I think it's interesting that the disciples' response is send the problem away, send the crowd away. Jesus' response is no, sit down. Keep the crowd in front of the disciples. You know, I think that's the heart behind this last lesson that we're going to talk about, is that we need to keep the world in front of us. We need to keep the world on the forefront of our hearts. Then Jesus took the loaves. And after he'd given thanks, after he prayed, he starts distributing them to those who are seated and also the fish, and they ate as much as they wanted. It was a miracle. You know, Jesus is inviting the disciples into this moment, into this miracle, and in a lot of ways they say no. In fact, the only person in this story that really says yes is the boy who offers his food, his two fish. And you know what? I have to believe that boy was not the only person that day that had food, but he was the only person with faith. He was the only person that put what he had into the hands of Jesus. Listen, the church today has way more than two fish. God has already given the church the solution to the problem. He's already put it into the world, into the story. The problem is we have not offered it into Jesus' hands so that he can do the impossible. When we think about the resources of the church, Christians around the world earn $50 trillion in annual income. There are 600 million Protestants around the world. The problem is not resources. The problem is that we've only given $1 out of every $100,000 we earn. You know, Americans spend more on Twinkies and their Halloween costumes for their pets than Christians give to reach the unreached. And when it comes to going, only one out of every 50,000 of Protestant Christians will go as these missionaries. We don't need to receive more blessing and receive more resources. We need to take more responsibility for the mission that God's given us. God calls us to solve big problems, not ignore them. Most of us, when it comes to God's mission, we think there's only one character, one role on the sign of sheep, and that's the missionary. And so that's why a lot of us have said no. But you know what? God has a role just for you. God doesn't want any spectators in his mission. He has a role just for you. 
And I've stopped using the term missionary. Today, I've been using a different term, world Christian. A world Christian can be any believer who plays their part in the story that God is writing. Now, world Christians, some of them are goers, some of them are missionaries who take the gospel overseas, but we're going to see that some of these roles involve sending out those people that go. Goers and senders, all of us can be a part of God's mission in the world. A world Christian sees the greatness of their life because they see the greatness of being a part of God's story. Where do we get this idea of being a goer and being a sender? We get it from one of the greatest pioneer missionaries in history, the Apostle Paul. Paul, as he went out on mission with God, he saw exactly what it took. He saw that there were different roles needed to fulfill God's mission. And that's why he says this in Romans 10, another very famous passage about how do we reach those who've never heard. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but how will they call on him who they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? That's what we've been talking about. The 1040 window, unreached people groups, this idea that one third of the planet still has never heard of Jesus. And that's why Paul says this, how are they to hear without someone preaching? So the first thing a world Christian says is that I must find a way to move the gospel out as a goer. When I picture this scene of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and then passing out food, I've got to imagine in these groups that some people were passing the food to people near them, but some people had to look down the hill. Some people had to look off into the distance and say there's still people who have not yet received this food. And a world Christian is thinking about both. A goer involves both those things. And, you know, we've done an okay job of reaching the people around us that look like us, but God has brought the nations near to us, and many of them have not met Christians or heard the gospel. And so the first thing a world Christian does is they say, I need to reach out to the nations that God has brought near to me. Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 10 both command us to love the international, to love the sojourner that God has brought near. You know, there used to be a time when you would only meet a a Buddhist or a Hindu in Manhattan, New York, but now you can meet them in Manhattan, Kansas. God has brought the nations near to us, and I've seen world Christians use all kinds of creative ways to build bridges of relationship to them through sports, food, uh, hobbies. And they build relationships with people so that they can build a bridge for the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's a student at a university nearby. Maybe it's a neighbor or a coworker. But when we see people the way God sees people, we begin to reach out to internationals that are near us. You know, I used to think that reaching the people near me was my only mission. I would tell people, you know, this is my mission field right here. And I would tell my friend, you know, I don't know why you care about sending missionaries to all these faraway countries and spending money to send people to these other nations when I know plenty of lost Christians in my city right now. But you know what he said to me? He said, Claude, that's the problem. You know them and they know you. He said, did you know the places I'm talking about in the world, there is no person like you. There is no Christian that can tell them. Gordon Conwell did a study and found that five out of six lost people on planet Earth are not relationally connected to any Christian. They're not gonna buy coffee next to a Christian, they're not gonna work next to a Christian, they're not gonna drive in traffic near a Christian. They are relationally unconnected with any Christian. They will never hear the gospel in their lifetime unless somebody changes their address, unless somebody changes their location to reach them. And that's why the second thing a world Christian knows is that we must move the gospel out to those who are far. This is what Jesus has commanded us to do in Matthew 28, to go make disciples of all the nations. And it's probably the command that has been dismissed the most by most Christians. It's too difficult, too impossible, not for me. And maybe this is the chance for you to think for the first time, how have I obeyed that command? How have you obeyed that command? Maybe it's short term, maybe it's for a summer, maybe longer. We need people to go for a long enough time to learn the language, learn the culture, to plant a church that reproduces. That's what God's called us to do. You know, I remember as a young married couple, my wife and I looking into going as missionaries, and we started trying to find a mission agency that we could trust that was experienced. And you know what, it wasn't easy. It's not one of those things that you can just Google. Uh, We almost needed a, a world Christian travel agent to help us. And so after that, we turned around and decided to help other people. For the last 20 years, 
We've helped people just like you find their way to organizations that are looking for people with your skills, your gifts. And we made it very easy to remember, if you're looking for a mission agency, you go to missionagency.org. You can fill out a profile, it's free, uh, but our staff will help you. They've helped thousands of people just like you get started in joining God in the area of going. You know, a lot of us dismiss going because we just don't see how. And I think the disciples missed this moment because they just couldn't see how it was going to happen. Most of the missionaries I know overseas today say, you know what? I didn't see how God was going to do it until I moved out in obedience and going. Maybe God wants to clarify his will for you in the midst of you obeying and moving out and taking a step in this area of going. You know, I see goers as these strategic arrows being sent all around the world to these unreached peoples. But listen, every arrow needs a bow. And the apostle Paul knew that. That's why the verse keeps going in Romans 10. He says, how can they hear without a preacher? But the very next verse says this, how can they preach unless they are sent. In other words, there's more than one role in God's story. There's more than one character involved, not just the cross-cultural goers, but the support and the senders behind them. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You know, this whole miracle of feeding the 5,000 doesn't start with the disciples. It starts with the sender. It starts with this boy who decides to give what he has and put it in Jesus' hands. You know, I remember trying to teach my boys to be generous when they were young. I wanted them to grow up to be generous, you know, human beings. The only problem is kids that are broke. Kids have no money. And so for them to be generous, I had to give to them first. And usually at Christmas time, we would buy gift cards uh, to a fast food place, and we would go drive around, and we would see people experiencing homelessness, and our kids would get out and run and, and give them a gift card, tell them Jesus loved them, and then it was their favorite thing to do. We would do it all evening. Really, we would do it until we ran out of, of gift cards. Yeah. And then eventually the boys would be like, let's keep going. And I'd say, no, man, we're, we've ran out. You know, we're done. And my boys would be like, let's buy more, Dad. Let's buy more. And then my son was like, yeah, Dad, why don't you give? You know, you ever have your kids try to turn things around on you? My son's like, yeah, Dad, when are you going to be generous? Yeah, Dad, when, why are you being stingy? When are you going to give to the poor? And that's when, you know, you have to pull the van over as a dad and kind of get some things straight. I was like, boys, I think you're forgetting I'm the one that bought the gift cards, right? Like, I gave first. Right? Who do you think is paying for the gas that we're using right now, right? Like, who do you think pay for the van that we're in? You know, in fact, this whole thing was my idea. I, in fact, you know, I gave first to you so that you could have the experience of being generous. And this is exactly what God has done for us. The world Christian knows that God has given to us, God has blessed his people to reach all peoples. God has blessed us so that we might be senders. You know, the third thing the world Christian does is they say, I need to support the work of missions as a strategic sender. Third John tells us that we should support workers like those that go so that we can be fellow workers with them in the truth. Maybe for you, it's finding out through your local church how you can give strategically toward what their missions efforts are or your denomination and what they're doing in reaching the world. Maybe you know a missionary who you could join their financial support team and bless them. See, when we value what God values, we begin to give as a sender. You might think, well, I don't have that much to give. And I want you to remember the boy only had two fish. into his harvest field. The world Christian knows that this is an impossible task, but when we work, we only get our power. But when we give and when we pray, we invite the power of God into this problem. We invite the power of God to do what only he can do in this mission. Listen, God has a world Christian part for you to play in this story. God has created a role and apart for you in this story, don't leave it blank. My prayer for you is that you wouldn't miss the part that God has for you in this story. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Is there a part of God's mission that you've said, man, this is so impossible, this is so overwhelming, that in your heart you've said, send it away? 
you said maybe somebody else will do it. And God's inviting you to not ignore big problems, but solve them. Maybe he's blessed you financially and he's inviting you to put that into his hands as a giver, as a sender. Maybe it's your location. Jesus is inviting you to put your location in his hands and become a cross-cultural goer. And if you have no idea where to start, we can help you. Just go to missionagency.org and our staff will help you find your place in his mission in the world. My prayer for you is this, that you would miss the part that God has written for you in his story. Listen, there's no spectators in this mission God has. But if you say yes, I believe God is going to surprise you, surprise you with the miracle stories that he tells in eternity. Can you imagine a day in heaven when you begin to get to see the impact of your life because you said yes to the part in the story that God's writing? I never thought of it that way when uh, he talked about the little boy with the fish, loaves and fishes, and uh, how he just generously give up his meal. And then when you find, think about in the hands of Jesus, how he can multiply a very little thing into a big thing. And I, I just thought about the, the, the very generous heart this young, this young boy had. Everybody else was wanting to not do, deal with the problem, but this this boy was willing to give up what he had. I'm, you know, I don't know what he, he I, doesn't sound like anywhere in the scripture he questioned that. So um, we become consumed uh, with fixing the problem that we forgot about. The only the let's see, uh, let me get back where I was supposed to be at. Um, Claude began with a story about his son, reminding us that a small part in a big story is a great honor. No matter what role we have in God's plan, big or small, we all get to take part in this in his mission. What are some of the ways you have considered serving the lost? In what ways are you or your church supporting international missions? And again, we're, we've just begun really getting more involved with what we're doing and trying to become uh, more mission focused. And, uh, you know, I know that, uh, uh, I mean, giving is a big important thing to, to, to making sure these missions are, are funded. Uh, and also, you know, the mission feels local too. So we have to make sure we take care of those around us. Uh, any thoughts on that question? So using, uh, using our gifts is important, but our work only makes the difference when coupled with the power of God. Sometimes unintentionally we have trouble inviting God into our solutions. We come, become so consumed with fixing the problem that we forget about the only one or who truly uh, changes hearts, God. Have there been a time when you have re, uh, relied only on your strength to reach others? Dismiss, dismissing God's hand, why is it difficult to relinquish control of our mission? There's a lot of things in just our culture that we want to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't need my help. I can just do it myself. Mm -hmm. But we don't like to ask for help from other people, or especially even from God. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And I mean, that kind of goes back into our prayer life. I mean, uh, I mean that's why we need to become more prayer focused than we are. I, yeah. do, I do realize the older I get, the, the less problem I have asking for help. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I can't move that refrigerator like I used to be able to. <laughs> I think a lot of people think asking for help is showing weakness. Yeah. Yeah. When I was younger, I tried to do everything myself, too. But after five back surgeries, I've learned. Oh, you can do that. You only had one back surgery and I learned it. Yeah. I'm a little hard headed. Than I, am. I haven't heard you women say anything to this. <laughs> right I haven't had any back surgeries and I've learned it. 
<laughs> so have there been times when you have relied only on your strength to reach others? Or is it easier for you women to just uh, plan on God helping you out through <laughs> your situations? You guys are just tougher than us guys. <laughs> well, I guess it's because we're so macho. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it, we're macho. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that I try to do myself, and then I wonder, you know, wow, maybe they need to pray about it. Um, but most people know the situation with my niece, and I've prayed more in the last few days than I've ever remembered praying before. I know that the only way there's going to be the right solution to this is if God takes a hold of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, world Christians are people who take part in God's global mission and are marked by four simple actions. First, they reach those who are nearby. Today, we don't need to travel across the globe to find unreached people, uh, people or uh, people groups. In many cases, God is bringing the nations to us. Consider some different people groups living around you. When you could, when you could, you do do. What could you do to reach out to build relationships with them? I think part of it goes back to some of your earlier study about being a neighbor. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Caring is the best. Caring and uh, uh, when, we, when we show that we really care for somebody, uh, I mean, just like what you're doing with Jeff, you're showing you care. And uh, I think uh, that speaks volumes. You, you, just the, the witness that it had on the man down in St. Louis. Those simple acts like that show that you're a caring church or a caring people. Uh, I mean, Jesus always went one-on-one -on -one to that person and he and he would heal those that came to him because he cared mm -hmm. and he loved them that much. Any other thoughts on that? I don't know if it's appropriate, but I, I remember even in, in business, it was people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. And once they know how much that you really genuinely care for their welfare, their well-being, their where they're going to spend eternity, they don't really care what, what church you go to or what you do until they realize they don't really like me. Right. I think I find it easier to ask for help when I'm doing something for somebody else than I do when I need help for myself. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing a project for a group or other people, I I don't mind asking for help. But I think you know, if I need help at my house, I wouldn't ask us for it. <coughs> Secondly, world Christians take the gospel to those who are far away. Although it is vital to reach those around us. There are still over 7,000 people groups that are yet to hear the name of Jesus. Examine God's calling in your life. Could God be calling you to go to the unreached as a group? Prayerfully discuss how good, how God could, how God might use us to reach one unreached group. Well, again, I think by us doing our mission, trying to meet our missions, because we know the Nazarene Church does a wonderful job in their mission programs. Is uh, you know one of the things I see is, is a very worthy cause. They're usually one of the first ones on the beat when the hurricanes hit down in Haiti and in those areas of the world and all and I and across the world. So that's one thing I know of. And we're also the last to leave. And the last to leave. Would you say that there are not any unreached people groups like there were just defining, like in Taylor, there just wouldn't be one because there's a church everywhere, and, and right? I mean, 
So there's not any of those people here, really. Is that right? I mean, they might have come here from that country, but once they're here, there's all kinds of access. Well, right? there, there are some Hispanic people here, but there are, uh, I don't know if there's an Hispanic ministry in town. Obviously, the ministries don't have one. But wouldn't Hispanic, Hispanic but, but being in Taylorville, doesn't that, if there's a church on every corner, does that mean they're, according to that guy's definition, well, a, an unreached people group is where there's not any access. Well, there is access here, right? right. There's no, so, I don't think there's any people in Taylorville with a language barrier no. to... So, that will qualify to be an un yeah. unreached pre so people. If we're going to do that, we either send people or go ourselves, but we can't do that here. If they're unreached, it's because they want to be unreached. <laughs> yeah. But There's, you're talking about they actually haven't heard the word. Yeah. Well, well I, and I, I mean, we've out, I mean, Christianity's always played the, the, the biggest role in, in our country. But if you went over to uh, Afghanistan, yeah. Uh, that's not what you're going to find in Muslim. Uh, you're going to find Muslims. Go to India, you're going to find Hindu. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, those are the those are the groups that are hearing our word, hearing the word of Jesus Christ. I know it, it's hard for me to understand that when we have soldiers in a lot of these places who have chaplains, and you would think that somehow, some way, the Afghanistan's people will hear the gospel. But what has our government been doing to those soldiers that can't claim to be chaplains? They've been putting well, a I thumb know. down on them, but that's and, just and they can't recent. share that message. That's just been recently, though. It hasn't no. always been that way. Not always, but now it is. Yeah. Because we, I was thinking about Peter Adams. I remember when he, uh, he was a chaplain uh, in the Army, I think it was. But I do know that he would be more or less told not to share. Mm. I guess you're supposed to be a feel good, make people feel good about something, but not Jesus Christ. Hmm. Well, and there's there's laws specifically about you know, that the, the soldiers, they're not supposed to proselytize. You know? I mean, I forget how we it was a mission system? We read something or somebody we knew was going and uh, they're warned not to you, know, you get arrested. Right. See, to the other thing you're talking about, um, I can't remember if it was an assembly. It wasn't this year, the Senate District Assembly, but in the past, recent past, um, I heard about a, uh, uh, a work that, our, that the Nazarene Church has, and I think it's in Texas. Where there is a um, like a meat packing plant. Cactus, Texas. Okay, cactus, Texas. They were up there, Thomas Speakers, and then they went down there. Okay, that's where I heard about it at at West Side. We had Faith Thomas and these missionaries were there. Cactus, Texas. They ha they have this meat packing plant. This plant has a vast majority of its workers are from overseas. And so like whole, you know, like all of a sudden in this town, there's a population of, where were they, Africa? A, a lot of places. Yeah. Middle East and Africa. Yeah, but I mean like, so these missionaries were saying the mission field just came to them. Came to them. And so right. the, the church has got all sorts of things going right there and um, that's that's another thing where like if you're if you're individually curious about those things you go into nazarene.org the missions part of it and you can find works that are going on and you know christmas is a time where you get catalog well, we do, catalogs from samaritan's purse and all these other mm -hmm. uh, all these other mission organizations which that's fine but our, our denomination has a lot of those things too. Right. Are already in place. Well, it's the end of the year too, and everybody's got their hand out right now. Everybody. And, uh, but uh, sometimes I was thinking about in your sermon today how it follows in Paul's missionary work that he was doing. Did it stop him, what he did? 
No, he, he got up and kept going. So uh, I don't know how tough a situation he was in. Um, let's see. Lastly, well, on this, I, we'll get to the scripture here in just a second. We're running out of time. But lastly, world, uh, the world Christians are prayer warriors. Whether we are goers or senders, we're all called to pray for one another and those who will come to know Jesus. Uh, in what spe specific ways can we pray for the unreached and the people participating in, in God's global work? And, I mean, we just got to pray. Uh, you just have to pray. All right, I need somebody to read uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 20 through 25. Uh, go ahead, John. Go for it. Come on, 20 and 25. <laughs> yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard uh, as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. While the more honorable parts do not require any special care, so God has put the bodies together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that are less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. Okay, thank you. Okay, in verses 20 and 21, Paul explained that the eye cannot be the hand nor the hand the eye. In other words, each of us plays a different role in missions of the church, and each of us is called to different areas of service. What specific ways do you think God could use you in his mission? What specific ways? One would be pray. We have to pray. Always start with prayer. Two, financially. Mm -hmm. Two, financially. Anything else that comes to mind? I mentioned even short-term mission trips. Yeah. And maybe even a letter to a missionary explaining that we're praying for them specifically <clears throat> and, you know, just kind of a word of encouragement to them because at the time they get it, they may be as low as they could get in their spiritual life and all of a sudden it takes that little letter from somebody that they don't even know that realize there's somebody in Central Illinois that's praying for us. Right. Yeah. Encouragement, I guess. I mean, that's always that. But that kind of encouragement is always welcome by anyone. So, again, it shows you're caring. And I kind of like it as an example of, of senders and goers. And I like the example of him buying the, the cards for his kids and then going around and having them hand those cards out. And uh, the, you know, the way he was funding that, and, uh, I mean, more or less, that's something that, that we can do also. Is, is that same kind of thought process. Not only do each of us have different ways of fulfilling our purpose, but each person's role is equally important. It can be easy to compare each other's gifts or challenge, callings to one another, but Paul makes the point that the gift from God is to be used for God. Every role is essential. Have you felt like your calling or purpose is not useful? Why or why not? I think sometimes if we don't see something happen, <clears throat> it kind of kind of wonder what's going on. I'm not sure how exactly heaven's going to work when we get there. <laughs> But I can't imagine what it'd be like to walk into heaven and somebody say, you know, you supported me yeah. when I did uh, such and such. I mean, first of all, I'm going to probably be on the ground not able to look up because I can't uh, yeah. be so grateful to be where I'm at. Yeah, exactly. But I think that could be running into some... I don't know how it's going to work. I, I still struggle understanding heaven uh, because just to get there is going to be... Yeah. Amazing. 
you know, you hear people say they're going to ask God this. I said, yeah. you're yeah. not going to ask him anything because you're going to be so blessed and so thankful. When you see him, you ain't going to be able to say anything. Exactly. <laughs> so, any other thoughts on that? As we wind this down, and I think we'll probably wind it down. Anything else about this uh, study that comes to mind that you want to share? I think the, you know, the importance of that scripture that we just read is the fact it takes all of us, all parts, to come together to do his work. Um, another uh, scripture that I had marked for us to think about as we prepare to leave is, let's see, whoops, oh, here it is. Okay. Out of 1 Peter 4, I'm going to be reading verses 10 and 11. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well. Use them well and serve one another. Uh, do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God has supplied. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, uh, just commit to the practice of playing your role in God's great story. And commit to inviting God God into the problem, expecting him to do much, much more with what we offer. What little we can offer, he can multiply and do so much, so many great things with. Anything else? Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the salvation that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ. But not only that, you give us the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us through our daily life to guard us, to teach us, to convict us, but most importantly, to let us know that we have you inside of us. And, and, in, and just to think that we have the creator God's power inside of us. Um, and I know what your intentions were when you created Adam and, and we messed it all up, but yet uh, we're so grateful for what you do for us. So Father, I wanna pray for each one here that we'd all um, have a caring spirit and that for these people that we've been talking about that have uh, either walked away from this church or have just walked away from you, help us to be uh, eager to help them find their way back. May we have the, the, just the word to say and just an inviting spirit, not, not anything, that, uh, uh, anything fancy. Just, just give us the courage to just ask them, come home. And uh, we're so grateful that, you, that you've allowed us <coughs> to be a part of that. So I just pray for each one as they go about this week to give them strength and guidance. And then we just look forward to, to what you have in plant store for us this week. We ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.